So before I introduce our leader of the Prostate Cancer Foundation, I just want to reflect for a moment on what we just heard, because it's profound. It's absolutely profound. And Mary Claire, you worked tirelessly for decades to get where you got with women with ovary cancer and breast cancer, and how now it's common sense to counsel their, their families. But your student and the team around her, which in no small part was built by this foundation, the dream team that we put together with um, collaboration with Stand Up to Cancer and AACR, uh, the Challenge Awards to Karen Knutson and Johan De Bono and Joaquin Mateo, um, the Young Investigator Awards to, to Heather and to Colin Pritchard. And you said, I believe it was zero to 60 in three seconds. I would go Tesla, I would say zero to 120 in 2.4 seconds. Dr. King, you must be so full of gratitude and happiness to see this today laid out in a disease that you thought about back in the day, but these guys really took it and made it huge. And when I, when I heard that Heather had started her first, you know, prostate cancer, you know, BRCA screening clinic in Seattle, it was just very heartwarming to me for many personal reasons. So I, wanna, I want you to stand up and let everybody give you a round of applause. So Jonathan Simons and I work right around um, the, the parallel known as 34 North. Uh, that's where we are when we're in the same place in Santa Monica, California, which is fairly often, but you know, we're out in the world uh, doing stuff all the time. Jonathan is, the, is not only in, the intellect behind this great foundation, um, my motivator, personal motivator, but he's also one of the great physician scientists in, in genitourinary oncology and has been you know, a source of mentor to me. There's no better person to talk science to and we can do it quickly. It's like shortstops and second basemen handing off, uh, handing off double plays. Jonathan works tirelessly uh, to raise money and resources for this foundation, something that is invisible to most of you. It's not invisible to us on the inside of the foundation. So it's with great pleasure, Jonathan, that I introduce you this morning to tell us about the state of the science. And um, I hope you too are enjoying this conference. <laughs> um, I don't know where the time went, but this is my 11th presidential address. Um, I've never thought it but as uh, more than a privilege, it also, as Mike Milken likes to say, it's an awesome responsibility to be the CEO and president of the foundation. But how lucky I am to have Howard Sewell and the program committee as this meeting is the phenotype. So could we all give the program committee and Howard a round of applause? Um, uh, the, my remarks today are about the state of science at the end of 2017, and, and they're all centered around the idea that every decision with precision in 2018. And you'll hear about the prosperity formula from Michael Milken, where health is one of the greatest things you could contribute to human prosperity. But our foundation's uh, created to put itself out of business with the thesis that the precision extinction of this foundation would be the sigma of appreciation, ascertainment in 2018, and action. Um, we have an enormous amount of appreciation. Uh, our science committee from the foundation is here in force. Paul Volante, Chairman Chris Evans, and Dr. Skip Holden, Jeff Sisk, Hank Nordoff, Shmuel Maytar, Dr. Andy von Eschbach, Molly Globus with PCF China, and Stein Eric Hagen. And 2016, as I said in the last presidential address, was going to be the year of exceptional responses to precision medicines, and that's exactly what you've seen. But what about 2017? Well, we have appreciation not just for our board of directors and a number of key donors and partners, 
Um, but actually, we have appreciation for the fact we have an incoming NCI director, and we actually have uh, an exceptional responder to national service, uh, Dr. David Shulkin, whose phenotype is he served both in the Obama cabinet and the Trump cabinet as our secretary of the VA. Um, we have five million units worth of appreciation in November, which has supported over $50 million of team science transformational in the history of cancer research, prostate cancer research. And um, we can't thank um, all those Mo Bros and sisters enough. Um, but what about the uh, human capital here? Well, we got 424 from academia, 112 from industry, drawn from 17 countries, 110 academic research centers, 46 biopharmaceutical companies, including generous supporters. Obviously, I said one incoming NCI director, one cabinet member, and one Mary Claire King, a role model for an enormous number of us. Um, we're running out of basically surface area of land to put the headshots of 226 PCF Young investigators since I became uh, CEO and president, but we have 226 right now, and they're leading in all kinds of way in our field. The foundation could not be healthier in terms of human capital with young leadership with extraordinary ideas for putting this foundation out of business with research. And of course, the diversity is an incredibly important biologic concept, as my mentor bon Don Coffey loves to teach. Um, this year, we have now 28% of the enterprise being led, basically, by women physician scientists, uh, basic scientists. We had our second annual Women in Science Networking Forum, and we've never been stronger, actually, in terms of the kind of diversity uh, that will accelerate uh, cures. And of course, that's not all. We have 372 young scientists and postdocs in the research enterprise, 220 active research awards right now. I don't see Howard that often, actually, on site visits at 110 million in play, 78 active teams. 72 research institutions, and we're global in 10 countries at this time, although we funded in 21 countries. Um, just as important, um, 20, 277 days into the year, um, we've had a published knowledge, unpublished data knowledge exchange basically every 3.1 days between the standalone journal clubs, the monthly scientific working groups, under Miyahara with our basically our unpublished uh, video conferences and this scientific retreat. Um, and that makes this foundation very special and I want to thank everyone with appreciation for participating. And also, we appreciate that every one of you came where you could have been someone else, somewhere else today. And there's a thesis that science in, from, on prostate cancer can end prostate cancer death and suffering that's a big thesis. Uh, to be Aristotelian, there's no great genius without a mixture of madness. Um, and being Aristotelian, we believe uh, we're testing the uh, thesis uh, and executing, as I'll discuss. Well, that's our appreciation in a nutshell. But what about ascertainment in 2018? I just wanted to make some uh, remarks with the McCusick coffee background, which is precision itself enters the literature um, with George Callender in the British Medical Journal in 1876, and the decision was amputate or not for gangrene. Um, but in fact, 120 years ago, Osler, in developing the first information visualization for precision medicine, um, wrote that the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease, and you've heard multiple talks from germline all the way uh, uh, to uh, uh, tumor microenvironment, that the future of our field in terms of the principles and practice of precision oncology to end death from prostate cancer will involve actually ascertainment, an Oslerian concept. Um, but what is, Osler, what is the etymology of ascertainment? It's a really amazing word which Osler understood because the cert that's in ascertainment and in certain, the cert is ancient Proto-Indo-European root. And it um, comes from cray, ascertain cray. And that means actually fundamentally to sieve, to separate, but also uh, to find out for sure by experimentation. So we found ourselves in, at the end of 2017 in this ascertainment year 
really doing what's at the fundamental, what's at the fundamental nature, I think, of what Oslerian medicine aspired to be when the first principles and practice that revolutionized basically the care of all patients was launched out of Baltimore. And I'd like to make a few simple prospections. Um, one is that now in 2018, the urologists and the radiation oncologists are ascertainers as family genetic counselors. And while we have an enormous amount of research to do on the meaning of a PAL-B2 mutation, um, et cetera, et cetera, the F in PCF is for families now, and taking the science all the way to making a difference, not just for the patient in front of you, but for his grandchildren, his sisters, his granddaughters. Um, second, that medical oncology has been utterly transformed and the concept of precision medicine, um, which is the right medicine for the right patient with the right target genes or Rx vulnerable pathways at the right time and in the time is basically a core part of how all medical oncology for advanced disease should be practiced. And importantly, we've heard about the possibilities of cell-free DNA and um, we're massive investors at over 70 million in defining the genome landscape. But the whole point for every one of our patients is simply to sieve so that the pink patient's genes get the pink pill and the blue patients get the blue pill and the, if, and the orange patients get the orange pill. And of course, I wouldn't be Jonathan Simons if the green patients didn't get antineoplastic immunotherapy that was targeted. Um, but what's really transformed this year is that we know ascertainment science, this whole activity, this Oslerian activity is going to require um, being in Washington in a way and thinking about our ethos as democratization itself. And you've heard multiple talks about this. Um, but, and we're going to need new big data tools connected to the electronic medical record. Um, but with the product being a prescription pad and a pen, and the appropriate cray and ascertain in sieving the patients for the right medicines, the right immunotherapy, or no therapy at all. Um, and if that's true, we'll need uh, precision drug discovery like never before now that we have made this massive transformation in our field. This is not an easy slide, but I will try to summarize it, and it's quite available to you in real time on our website. At this time, we have 20 different genome-based or hard science-based targets for precision drug discovery uh, for the patients in the audience to sieve, to treat the pink pill with the pink patient, et cetera. And this is rather quite an extraordinary contribution of the entire PCF research enterprise in at least uh, six countries. And it behooves me to remark that if you look carefully, we couldn't even be halfway with drugs and clinical trials at only 8 in 20 of these targets. And it behooves me to say that uh, under 21 is your target next year for our Challenge Award applications. This is the Jerry Maguire part. Show me the money, Jerry. Um, but also, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And 10 of these 20 targets right now represent lethal drivers in advanced breast cancer. So a dollar for PCF precision prescription pad R&D is a dollar against half the time in solving the breast cancer problem that devastates um, so many of those we love. And I wanted to make an additional point for 2018. Uh, colon cancer is 100% Wnt pathway driven, and we know from this aggregate of beautiful work, 24 years in the history of the foundation, 24% of patients with lethal prostate cancer are succumbing to wind-driven tumors. Um, since we're in Washington, I want to announce in terms of ascertainment, we've ascertained to choose to attack canonical wind and non-canonical wind and attract colon cancer researchers to the PCF research community, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Um, the math proof for just this precision prescription pad right now 
If you put 20 million on a set of challenge award teams just against these current targets, um, you need 420 million. This is a foundation that's raised in its life over 730 million, and it's chaired and founded by Michael Milken. So we're not daunted by this idea, but we hope that Many versus Cancer is a huge opportunity um, because it is many versus cancer um, to raise money uh, in order to put dollars down on early stage precision medicine R&D and all the science around ascertainment that that includes. And actually the value proposition is greater. Um, Chenayan and Schultz both validated this. If you just took the target list right now where we were telling the NCI and um, uh, reporters that these cancers here were obviously uh, dependent in part on a successful PCF to fast forward medicines like we actually fast forwarded ipilimumab. Uh, it's really many versus cancer and that the value proposition is 52 cancers and solving them at least are actually dependent on the success of our foundation accelerating progress. I was very moved by the set of the talks here about um, access to precision medicine. And just because in 2018, it's only 1% of the population that at FGFR3 targetable fusions doesn't mean that that one patient can't be rescued one at a time in the thousands in a way in which we're ascertaining constantly for patients back into remission disease-free. And another interesting aspect of this kind of ascertainment is that telling those stories in social media, empowering patients to actually talk about their experience of precision oncology using the social network, using the social media platform of Many Versus Cancer, we think will actually accelerate patient participation in um, precision medicine. The ascertainment problem uh, is fascinating because now at the Ann Arbor VA and at the University of Michigan, you can ascertain in under 21 days and less than the cost of one MRI, a significant amount of the entire pre precision medicine prescription pad. But the real question is, can we scale and extend and democratize and that's the real setup for why we're so excited about our partnership with the VA. And the concept is that as we learn how to do the workflow of ascertainment, no veteran will be left behind um, since, as you'll hear, the VA is the number one health system in the country with the most number of prostate cancer patients. In fact, prostate cancer is the number one cancer in the VA. So part of our 2018 ascertainment strategy is to scale out precision oncology, precision medicine um, for veterans. And we met at 0630 this morning. There were over 40 of us. Um, we, um, that's uh, kind of late in milking hours. Um, you'll hear later from the Secretary uh, VA Shulkin. Um, but we have this five-year, $50 million commi commitment, actually, to scale uh, precision oncology precision genetics, precision genetic counseling. Um, in 153 hospitals and 788 outpatient clinics in the United States and its territories as a part of our national obligation um, to move science uh, to those who've served our country. And actually, I need to go back one. And I want to particularly recognize Matt Reddick and Bruce Montgomery, who co-chaired the steering committee, uh, for their enormous leadership. They're Based in PCF fund, highly funded, we call, they're in Jedi, PCF Jedi rich environments, of course, at the Hutch and the UW and at UCLA, but they're completely embedded as well and leaders in the VA itself and actually have been kind of a role model of um, how, uh, how to work inside the system uh, collaboratively and also leverage the extraordinary amount of NCI support in the, their respective NCI spores and their NCI comprehensive cancer centers. We think this model doesn't stop with prostate cancer, but could scale to every major form of cancer that affects a veteran. Um, but what we want to do in the next several years is simply scale. I 
don't want to just talk about nucleotide sequences and tyrosine kinases. I want to point out that the New Yorker itself had Ken Pienta, who is Sid Harth and Mukherjee, talking about the RFA for 2018, although we didn't know it. It's the, we're intensely interested in the tumor microenvironment and its biology um, for new targets and basic science of understanding how to create extinction events in those uh, microenvironments. And um, recently, uh, ferroptosis itself, a potential extinction mechanism we hadn't anticipated, um, driven by TGF-beta and ZEB1, has been reported out of Boston. And it's this sort of thinking about prostate cancer that isn't even on the precision prescription pad at the end of uh, uh, this year that we're inviting for challenge awards in uh, 2018. Um, I do want to give a commercial announcement that the GP is a glutathione peroxidase, and there's a long and rich and storied question as to why the first genomic alteration in prostate cancer is methylation off of GSD pi. Um, we've heard a lot about exceptional responders. Uh, we forecast this year would be that. Um, Jenna. Bishop's and, and uh, Julie Graff's contributions have been highly cited. But for the patients and supporters in the audience, we didn't want to lose the idea that um, harnessing, understanding why the immune system works when it does, even at low frequency, is going to be a huge set of clues for teams with Carl June with the development of all kinds of new strategies to bioengineer a better immune response, but to basically clear out prostate cancer with the T-cell receptor-driven uh, response uh, the size of ping pong balls is a biologic result we had not seen in the 20th century. And um, Ravi Madden, our PCF young investigator at the NCI, has basically uh, given us a provocative hypothesis just in translational science that maybe parlation inhibitors um, with PDL1 inhibition isn't simply just a story of neoantigens, but actually a tumor microenvironment story that will need to be pursued. Um, so a focus of 2018 Challenge Awards is going to be in this significant number of control points in the tumor microenvironment for uh, response or not response, um, the best, edgiest, riskiest, most interest, and most rigorous questions about how to take basically a non-immunogenic environment into a metastasis that's had a catastrophic extinction event uh, from T cell responses. And Cromwell was right, nature can do more uh, than physicians. Um, we're going to be very interested in the microbiota and particularly precision nutrition in 2018 as the field has become ripe. And now we know that there's a significant interaction in and of itself um, with innate immunity. Um, and we invite um, basic scientists and uh, those with an interest outside of prostate cancer uh, to come aboard. Wrapping up, um, we look at a lot of heat maps. Um, this is a heat map of human beings. Uh, to the left is the county mortality rates, basically, at the level of um, prostate cancer. Uh, for men of African descent. And on the right is simply uh, total county population as a function of African Americans. And we're committed in 2018 to ascertaining new hypotheses on the genomic basis of the excessive lethality of prostate cancer in men of African descent. And one of the exciting things about our partnership now with the VA is that the system um, will allow us actually to look across the country um, in terms of validating uh, some of these really important uh, genomic hypotheses that we have. We see the VA as a program as a part of a way of solving the genomic basis of uh, disparity. And of course, um, there were 57, I took down 57 basic science questions uh, for basic investigators from the poster session last night. I wanted to concentrate on one in Washington with the theme of veterans and volunteer work. The far left is John Willie, 
who very publicly was a patient advocate for the DOD and the Prostate Cancer Foundation, was doused, was Agent Orange in Vietnam as a swift boat captain, actually, got prostate cancer, was one of the first patients to actually get whole genome sequencing, um, and as a part of an NCI-PCF spore collaboration, had his entire clinical history, um, basically the clonal evolution of his tumor, uh, characterized along with his treatment course. And what I wanted to point out over these um, 18 years is that at the very end of John's um, experience, he participated in seven clinical trials um, and wanted to be public about the ability to volunteer even uh, to help the next man. Um, at the end of his clinical course, his KI-67 level, his G1S fraction, went from 2% when I first evaluated his tumor um, uh, to 32% in the final two years. And thinking a lot about that with an RB++ background, thinking a lot about that in John, one of our basic science questions for 2018, a basic science challenge is what are the switches? for what we think is almost a blast crisis towards the end, where patients get carcinemic with circulating tumor cells. Um, and the far right is the KI-67 for his uh, terminal metastases. Um, this can't be a simple problem necessarily, but it invites um, great uh, consideration for uh, CRISPR-Cas9 experiments and actually building mouse models backwards off the, basically, the terminal phase clonotyping. And I would like to suggest in closing that very few of us would want to drive a Ford Fairmont from 1979 now, and very few of us could think that PC3, though valuable as a research tool in culture since 1979, would be as important for hypothesis generation for basic science of homo sapiens with prostate cancer, particularly this late stage G1S switch, is actually multiple N equals one, clonotyping, genotyping, uh, case studies. And the foundation is very interested in um, basically N equals one times many patient genomic clinical courses to better inform our understanding now of the natural history and now the treatment history of uh, prostate cancer in an age of ascertainment and uh, precision oncology. So the top lines are the genomic landscape of CRPCA has created a version 1.0 uh, prescription pad. Um, we think that 4 to 8 percent of patients right now actually have uh, clinically very meaningful responses to uh, anti-PD-1 or PDL one therapy, but this can't be as simple as MSI, um, but we require a significant amount of additional research in defining what defines a uh, exceptional response or a clinically meaningful response. Um, we need a lot of novel agent R&D, which is great fodder for our young investigators who are not afraid of uh, novel chemistry and novel targets. And um, we're skeptical um, that cell-free DNA, as valuable as it is, will be maybe as valuable as also having 100 percent ascertainment of the metastasis treating prostate cancer in the same way we treat lymphomas now, in a responsive or an anticipatory way, um, with curative intent at all time. But understanding that clonal evolution and evolution in the microenvironment may be an essential part of the Oslerian version 2.0 way of practicing precision medical oncology. Well, I've talked about our appreciation I've talked about our ascertainment opportunities, and I wanted to talk, lastly, about action. Um, I started in an Aristotelian way, so I'll finish. The end of this science is not knowledge, but action. And in fact, there's no one more Aristotelian, and there is no one more obvious as an exceptional responder for 24 years than one man that took action when he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, uh, Michael Milken. And some of you who are new may not know that the foundation in its life has seen a 52 percent reduction in the death rate from prostate cancer in this country since Mike became the chairman and founder. 
And some may not know that PCF research awards over the history of the foundation have impacted every evidence-based decision node um, in urology, radiation oncology, medical oncology, pathology, genetics, radiology, and now nuclear medicine, and somebody will email me later, but we haven't impacted anything in, to do with focal therapy or health services research. We've stayed very focused. And lastly, the $730 million is a model of how a foundation can leverage but support higher risk, higher return research has become a model for many, many other medical research foundations, not just in oncology. Um, but the biotech valley of death crossing and how this foundation has taken a personal and foundation-wide and board down interest in making your science cross the valley of death if it could reduce death or reduce suffering is a core part of the DNA. And lastly, it'll be your privilege to hear from Mike again. Michael Milken really is the citizen scientist for prostate cancer, what Eleanor Roosevelt was for polio. So finally, if PCF's for you, how can you take action for PCF? Well, you can join Many Versus Cancer STAT, and certainly before you leave, and encourage patients and families to join. You should practice ascertainment in every prostate cancer patient in 2018. You should drug the currently undruggable in your laboratories if you can on the PCF prescription pad. You should go to the website, the new website, and look for RFAs and PCF news. Um, you should participate in Movember, our great partner uh, this November. You should enlist young investigators in 2018 and understand their young investigators' special funding opportunities, 12. In fact, um, just since our fundraiser in the Hamptons in the VA. You should apply for 2018 Challenge Awards and VA Valor uh, Challenge Awards opportunities. And you can collaborate with our new program or explore collaborations in our new program for the Precision Oncology uh, program by subscribing to the newsletter that we're beginning to send out at rlevine at pcf.org. And you can share hot unpublished data of the PCF Knowledge Exchange when it's hot by emailing uh, uh, Andrea or Howard. Please apprise us if what you invent or what you start up. Uh, tell us how to improve our 25th annual retreat based on this one. And finally, um, please accept our appreciation uh, for all that you've done, all that you do, and all that you'll do uh, in fast forwarding research uh, curing together. Um, God, God bless you all, and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you.